Today I'm going to talk to you about the interim response or ecological response of phase one of the Kissimmee River Restoration Project. Now for those of you not familiar, the Kissimmee River is located in central Florida. It flows from Lake Kissimmee southward into Lake Okeechobee. Its headwaters are the Kissimmee chain of lakes, which are 19 interconnected water bodies right above it. So water flows from below Orlando through the chain of lakes into the Kissimmee River and down into Lake Okeechobee. Now prior to channelization, this is what the Kissimmee looked like during the dry season. Water is maintained uh, mostly within the river channel, not on the floodplain. But as the seasonal fall rainfall begins, water starts to increase in stage and the river channel would move laterally out onto the floodplain. So you have the Kissimmee is a very low gradient black water river. You see sandbars on the inside bends of the, of the river channel. Um, it's anastomosed, meaning it's a braided channel. There's a primary channel, there's secondary channels on the floodplain. Uh, supposedly drove the steamboat drivers way back when crazy because they would get lost a lot. Um, it runs between a one to two mile wide floodplain. Well, in the late 1940s, a couple of hurricanes came through the area and there was prolonged flooding, almost up to a year. And that prompted the call for flood protection, <laughs> which the Army Corps said, we can do that. And between 1962 and 1971, they dredged the C-38 canal down the center of the floodplain. And here you see the, the big dredge. They've built a, a levee and they're dumping the spoil material directly on the adjacent floodplain wetlands. So that was almost 10 years to go to, to channelize this system. You end up with the C-38 canal, which is 65 miles long, replacing a 103 mile long meandering river channel. Um, you have six water control structures that compartmentalize this flood conveyance canal into five pools. Um, the design here is to very efficiently move large quantities of water from south of Orlando at low velocities down into Lake Okeechobee. Well, what were the effects of channelization? This is up at the top next to Lake Kissimmee's at the top of the picture. Uh, Highway 60 bridge is right here and here's the Kissimmee coming down. It was very, very, very efficient in what it was designed to do. That 30 foot deep canal dropped the water table, sucks all of the water off the adjacent floodplain, and it very efficiently moves that water as it was designed. However, the effects and the impacts of channelization on water regulation to the ecology was dramatic. Um, you had the loss of something called the annual flood pulse. Like I said earlier, annually, as we move from the, the dry season to the wet season, rains are occurring, water starting to come up in stage in the river channel, it moves laterally out onto the floodplain. As water's moving laterally and re-inundated the floodplain, primary productivity is going crazy. Plants are growing, paraphytons growing, bugs are coming to use the plants, uh, fish are moving out in the floodplain to eat the bugs, the birds are coming in to eat the bugs, the plants, the fish, everything is out there, and you have this amazing energy source that is driving the food web. And then when you have the receding waters as you move into the dry season, it's bringing all that organic material back into the river and food web. So it's this great cycle that was going on. But once you've severed that connection of the river channel from the floodplain because you've dredged this canal, you have the shift in uh, the floodplain from the wetlands that were there to now cow pasture. Uh, there is much fewer wading birds and ducks. In fact, uh, the wintering waterfowl population decreased by 90%. You have the loss of this highly productive floodplain habitats, which I talked about, and interruption of um, nutrient cycling and food web dynamics. Then within the river channel itself, of what remains of the river channel, you had the loss of flow. Now you had the C-38 coming straight up and down through, the, through the, the floodplain, and you still have these remnant river runs that are bisected by the canal. They don't receive flow. The canal's 30 feet deep. These are 8 to 10 feet deep. All the water is really going down the center of the canal. So without flow. You have the increase of the vegetation encroaching to the center of the floodplain. Those lines are the actual riverbank. So you have floating, mat forming vegetation that is growing and dying and growing and dying and it's leaving this accumulated organic material in the natural historic sand substrate. Um, two factors compound here to decrease dissolved oxygen levels. You have a lot of decomposition going on in that organic material. That's sucking water uh, oxygen out through biological oxygen demand. And then without flow, you don't have turbulent mixing. So you have this crash of DO in these remnant river runs, and you have a shift in the invertebrate and fish communities that can actually survive in that type of environment. 
with only five years following completion of channelization, the grassroots movement takes hold. 1976, Florida legislature passes the Kissimmee River Restoration Act. Um, they say, let's restore the seasonal water level fluctuations in the floodplain. And most importantly on here is utilizing the natural and free energies of the river system to the greatest extent possible. Instead of building something that is engineered such a way that we have to have pumps, you have to use a lot of energy to try to move the water around, get water on the floodplain, let's let the river heal itself with the energy that it naturally has. Here's a project timeline for you just to give you an idea of how long it takes to do large landscape scale restoration. Um, you have the, red, the 1976 Kissimmee River Restoration Act. Uh, the feds come in and do a first feasibility study in 1978. It doesn't take because the goal they have doesn't allow for them to show an economic benefit. So the district does a demonstration project in 1984, which I'll talk about, saying what are some of the ways that we could go about uh, restoring the river. And there was a physical model that was built out in California, Berkeley. To get some more information, a very important symposium was held between the agencies that were conducting research between 84 when the demonstration project occurred to 1988 to say, are we seeing response to the, the little miniature uh, restoration efforts that we have and, and is large scale restoration feasible? Then we wrote up, the district did in 1990, an alternative plan for these are the different types of, of construction features we think you could do in order to do this restoration which the Army Corps then turned around in a year, basically took that document and put it into Army Corps ease and made it into the 1991 feasibility report, which in another year was quickly turned around to the Chief's report, which went to Congress and was passed and adopted through the 1992 WERDA. And then in 1994, we established the first 50-50 cost share between the state and the federal government to do restoration of this scale in the state of Florida. So, 18 years from when they said, let's restore the Kissimmee, until we actually had a partnership with the Army Corps to do this work. Uh, five more years until we could actually do some turned dirt. And then there's 16 years of construction. So this is 40 years of, of labor. A lot of people, if you, if you live in the SERP world, which is the Everglades restoration, they ask, well, why aren't you further along? Look at Kissimmee, it's doing really well. Well, Kissimmee's doing really well, but there's 25 years behind us that we've already gotten to this point. Uh, the demonstration project was pretty interesting. They said, well, what's a, a good way to restore the hydrologic connectivity with the floodplain? And they said, let's put in a weir. Basically, it's sheet, sheet piles uh, pushed down into the canal with a little notch for navigation that during periods of high flow, as water is flowing up the screen, it's going to push water back into this river channel and laterally out into the floodplain. You're like, cool, you know, we're getting water out in the floodplain like we said we wanted to do. However, once the low flow condition resumes, which is pretty quickly in this system, all the water comes rushing off of the floodplain. So you don't get your hydro period benefit on the floodplain to actually show a change in the plant community for everybody to go out and take advantage of what's occurring on the floodplain. Uh, then we, there was a physical model that was built in the University of California, Berkeley to look at the construction methodologies of what can we do then if the weirs aren't the best attempt, how can you construct a project that won't suck water off the floodplain when there's no flow? So it was pretty neat, did studies where here you see on the left is a complete backfill of the C-38 canal, the weirs only, they did some uh, just blocks of backfill and tried to look and see how can we actually keep water on the floodplain and it was the complete backfill project that that was the only one that, that met the criteria needed to keep water on the floodplain with decent hydro periods. So you see it's a, it's a pretty big model, it's pretty neat. Uh, 1988 state and federal agencies met to say what have we seen between 1984 and 1988 for the different ecological components of the system that we we're out there studying. And uh, they found, wow, the, dim the, the response to this project has been pretty dramatic in only four years. So you get some flow in the river channel, that was good. Um, you got some water out in the floodplain. If we can do this on a bigger scale and actually get the hydro periods right, we think we can have a very successful large scale project. And at this symposium, we also adopted the ecological integrity goal of the project and established five hydrologic criteria that are necessary to achieve that ecological integrity goal. Now here's the ecological integrity goal, it's a lot of big words up there. 
basically it says that if you do this project, it's going to sustain itself. And it's going to maintain the same complement of organisms that was there historically or within a pretty natural area within the same region. So it's a do it, it's going to take care of itself, just add water, they will come, <laughs> you know, and, and, and it's going to sustain itself through time. And then there's five hydrologic criteria, which I'm not going to read through, but the first through three deal with characteristics of flow within the river channel and stage discharge relationships and variability throughout the year. And then the second two deal with characteristics of water on the floodplain. So then the approach to, to restoring the Kissimmee was we need to reconstruct the physical form of the river. Backfill the C-38 canal so there's no longer sucking water off of the floodplain. Reconnect those remnant river runs, fill secondary ditches out on the floodplain, provide a physical habitat template to which you then can modify the inflows from the headwater system in order to meet those five hydrologic criteria that mimic the historic condition. And with these two working in concert, we believe we can restore ecological integrity to the central portion of the river system. And this is what it looks like. Here's your floodplain from tree line to tree line. Over here, it's about two miles wide. You've backfilled the C-38 canal for a stretch. Here's a spoil mound where the dirt was that was used to dump right back into the river. Uh, and now you have this beautiful, free-flowing, natural river system within the floodplain like it's supposed to be. Um, here is the end of phase one, and this is where the C-38 canal was, and in only the five or six years in between these two phases, you can't tell this bit of floodplain, you know, from any other. So it, 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 res it responds very, very quickly. And then we mimic the historic inflows to the project in 2015 when construction is complete. What I'm going to show you today are some interim response within the phase one area, which has been completed since 2001. It's had a certain type of hydrology, but it's not the hydrology that we say is going to drive all this change. We implement that once all construction is done in 2015. But still, in this interim hydrologic condition, you're going to see that the, the response is pretty remarkable. So the project itself, 50-50 cost share between the state and federal government with the Army Corps being in charge of engineering, planning, and construction. Uh, the district has to buy the lands, and then my group uh, of scientists, we do the restoration evaluation to see if we're meeting that ecological integrity goal. The project's going to backfill 22 miles of the C-38 canal. Uh, we get about two miles of river channel back for every mile that we backfill of canal because of the sinuosity of the river. So we get about 45 miles of contiguous restored river channel. Um, we're going to remove two water control structures. We've already moved, removed S65B. S65C will come out in about 2014. And then, as I said, we'll mimic the historic inflows to this project once construction is complete at 2015. And then my group, we have five years to go and reevaluate the system based on the studies that we did during the baseline condition and was still channelized to see have we met the, the individual target or metric targets that we've established. Uh, phase one backfilling was completed between 1999 and 2001, and it backfilled seven and a half miles of the C-38 canal. It recarved a mile of river channel. What we, we call a recarved sec section is sometimes that spoil that was put on the adjacent floodplain wetland obliterated or filled in a section of river channel. So we would look at the aerials and try to find the natural flow path and recarve that section back out so that it will function the way it did historically. Uh, we removed a water control structure, and we end up with 14 miles of contiguous, physically restored river. Uh, this was the day that we blew up S65B, and we all sat upstream and, whoa! <laughs> and right before that last blast, before the horn went off, this one bird came and landed on the structure, and our avian ecologist said, oh, that's the last male of the breeding pair of the... <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh -huh. Phase 4A came right behind that, and it went northward from phase 1. Uh, it went up another um, two miles. Here's, you see the sequence of it happening it occurred between 2006 and 2007. So we backfilled two more miles of the canal, recarved another mile, uh, reestablished four more miles of river channel. That got us up to 18. And then we had phase 4B, which started in 2008. And uh, this was really cool in that the contractor who did the first phase, the foreman, won the bid for this phase. 
and he had learned a tremendous amount. And he built this, while he's trying to backfill the C-38 canal, he built a bypass flowway for water to go around so his equipment could work dry during the entire year. He underbid everybody by millions of dollars and he finished a year ahead of schedule. And that was just, that's, that was incredible. Yeah, that, that was good stuff. And so here you see he's got the bypass going on. He's backfilling the C-38 canal. And this is a section of river channel that was recarved. So it's pretty impressive to see all that going on simultaneously. So the grand totals from phase one to where we are, phase 4B now, we have 14 miles of backfilled C-38 canal, 6 miles of recarved river, 24 miles of contiguous river channel, and 15,000 acres of physically restored habitat, which from the air looks like that. So it's awesome. You still have the C-38 canal to the north and the south, but in this central portion, it looks like any free-flowing river that you would see in aerial photography. So it's pretty tremendous. What my group does is we are doing the comprehensive restoration evaluation program. How do we evaluate whether or not that ecological integrity goal is being met? And we do this from an ecosystem perspective instead of single species management. Are we just making some great duck habitat? Are we, are we producing a really good fishery? We're saying we're looking at it holistically to meet that ecological integrity goal. And to do so, we have scientists that are looking at hydrology, geomorphology, uh, dissolved oxygen and water chemistry. Then you go up to the plant communities and then we're going to go through all the critters. We have the bugs and the fish, which I study the fish, the avian uh, and threatened and endangered species. So it, it's a holistic approach of looking and evaluating this ecosystem to see if we're meeting the goal that we set. And how we do that is through a design called the Backy design. And this is conducting a series of, of studies or monitoring before and after a perturbation, and in this case, it's actually restoration. So before we did anything, when the whole uh, system was channelized, we conducted duck surveys in the control area, pool A, this will never be restored. And then we go and we do the same studies at the same time in the phase one area. And you expect under channelized conditions for conditions to be pretty similar within these. There might be a little bit of environmental variation, but they're going to be very, very similar. And then you come back and you do the same studies again after restoration has occurred, and you wouldn't anticipate very much change up here in the control area, but you expect a tremendous amount of change in the impact area where restoration is taking place, and that's what you attribute to restoration and the success that you're seeing. Um, we published the work that we did between 1995 and 1999 to establish the baseline condition in a series of compendia, which we also developed 25 performance measures. And this is for each of the, that laundry list of, of components that I showed you. We'll have uh, discrete numbers, targets that we have established for what's the hydrology going to be, what's the water quality going to be, what are metrics in the fish community that I think are going to occur what's going to happen to waterfowl numbers and densities on the floodplain. So we have these established. We tell you how we did it so it can be reproduced. And uh, just all the information you need to do, go out and do that again. And so this is, we're really proud of this suite of performance measures. And this is what we will use to evaluate the success of the project. This is what it looks like when you're done. You've finished a phase of construction. You have the C-38, which has been backfilled. This is one of the areas where the dirt was that you took to push into here. So you have a remnant river run that's running now, goes across, meets up with the next river run. You have that fat physical habitat template to which you can apply the appropriate hydrology. Where we're going now, as I said, we haven't and won't implement that hydrology until 2015. But since 2001, we have had an interim kind of hydrologic condition where the water has been continuously flowing in the river channel. We have had water out in the floodplain, and we've seen some pretty dramatic initial response. So I'm going to go through this, and, and uh, it just pictures tell it all. So you're getting that return of the flood pulse. Here you are in June, up at the top. Water levels are low, the rainy season's coming on. By July, stage is already coming up and water's starting to move laterally out onto the floodplain. Uh, we've had continuous flow in all years except for the really bad drought in 2007 where we didn't have flow from uh, S65. We had to shut it down for 254 days. But other than that, we've had continuous flow through the system. Uh, we're looking at hydrologic variability in this 
throughout the year. And to make it a little more simple, the reference condition or the historic condition is in blue and the interim condition that we're in right now is red. And they look pretty close, but what you see is there's, there is some difference where we're having to, based on the regulation schedules in the upper chain of lakes, which you're trying to move water out to provide storage as we move into hurricane season, you see we're getting higher discharge in that portion of the year coming to the river. And then once you've moved that water out of the upper chain, you're not getting the same amount of water that you need following that. So they're looking kind of good. We are getting water through the system, but it's not occurring with the same variability that the historic system uh, had. Uh, these are floodplain wells, uh, stage wells, from north to south. And you see above the line over here, water is above ground and it's below ground. So you're, having, you're seeing your wet, dry season there. And that's really good. And that's in the northern part of the restored area. But down here at the bottom, you have the S65C still here, and you have very regulated waters. Uh, it's, it's not doing that fluctuation that you would anticipate. It's because that structure is still there. You're getting a backwater effect from the structure up, and you're creating those stabilized water conditions that will be ameliorated when that structure is taken out in 2014. Um, we have an expectation for, I told you about the organics that were um, being accumulated on the sand substrate because plants were growing and dying and growing and dying. Well, we expect for that substrate overlying deposits to decrease by 65%. And here's two core samples, one taken from a remnant channel and one taken from a store channel. And you see those organics are blown out. They've been up to a meter deep in some areas. So this is really good, um, especially if you're thinking about uh, ameliorating oxygen, oxygen conditions. But also, if you're looking at the fish community, centrarchid, they bass and sunfish, they build their little pit nests by fanning their tail in the sand. You do that in muck and it just it doesn't do well. So you're saying, wow, sand's a good habitat for a lot of the different critters that uh, live in the system. So we've seen that tremendous decrease in the organic materials. We've met this expectation actually already. Um, point bars will form on the inside of the river bends. When I showed you that historic aerial, you saw on the inside of the bends there was a sandbar. We looked at, uh, at 1950s maps, aerials, and there's 132 bends on the river channel with this type of angle, and there was 132 point bars. And you look at those after channelization, and everything kind of U-shapes down, and you lose those sandbars without flow. Well, in the restored area, because of flow, every of the 60 bends that we have has one of these nice sandbars. And uh, you say, OK, well, it's a sandbar. You know, Yay, <laughs> have, go have, have a picnic or something. But, you have the inside, which is now shallower, water's moving slower, the outside, deeper, moving faster. If you're a, a, a small fish that, that turns sideways you know, in the wrong channel and gets blown a mile down the river, you know, that's bad. So this creates microhabitat for greater species diversity, because you have more species that can have a niche in, in one of these types of flow environments or sand environments. And uh, you see that it, it just isn't opportune time to increase diversity. Um, dissolved oxygen levels. Here we're going to have the baseline condition while it's channelized, the post construction, which is after 2001, and the reference condition that we have set for this. And what you're seeing here is that in the control area up in pool A, pre and post construction, DO levels are at one during the wet season. And that, that's, that's con a condition in which fish have shut down everything except for survival. Um, you know, you have these horrible dissolved oxygen conditions that cause the shift in fish and invertebrate communities. So there's been no change there. And likely, uh, likewise, in the dry season, the winter, when uh, colder water holds more oxygen, we're seeing the same um, kind of depressed dissolved oxygen levels at three. But in the um, restored area, you have almost a three-fold increase in dissolved oxygen levels in the wet season from one to three. And that's approaching that target of four. And then during the dry season, you have a two-fold increase from three to six. And that has met that. So dissolved oxygen levels changed really rapidly. It was within the first year. You had blown out the or, or, uh, accumulated organics. And you had turbulent mixing again and the dissolved oxygen levels reestablished and all of the different organisms that need that high DO is going to start following that same trend. 
Here's the floodplain that had been converted to basically Bahia pasture following channelization. And then you have this wonderful wetland mosaic following inundation. So that happens pretty quickly as well. Uh, we do vegetation mapping and one of the expectations that we have is 80% of the floodplain which is, is going to be wetland vegetation which is the blue that you see. So in the 1950s you have 80% of the floodplain is wetlands. In 1996 you see that has decreased dramatically. In the 2008 vegetation map only seven years following uh, completion of phase one we're back to 80%. So you look at that and you're like wow you've achieved everything you need with wetlands on the floodplain. But it's not the case if you go and you look at it from what vegetation types were present. Um, in this pre-channelization map, this dark color here is broadleaf marsh. Broadleaf marsh has the longest hydro period, the greatest depth requirement of your marsh species here of plants. And then you have along the peripheral, you have the wet prairies. Uh, under channelization, this is all pretty much pasture. And now we've got some bit of broadleaf marsh. We do have the wet prairie coming back in the, in the kind of peripheral. But up here where this should be broadleaf marsh, it's still a wet prairie. It's, it's not a shorter wet prairie as, as Panicum, and it's kind of making that transition. But this is the great thing to say, yes, we're seeing change, but we don't have the hydrology correct yet. We don't have those deeper areas. We don't have those longer hydro periods, and we shouldn't. That doesn't happen until 2015. So this is one of the things you can say, yeah, we're seeing great change, but we need to complete the project in order to bring the magnitude of change which we expect to occur. And then one thing that we're also seeing because of that backwater effect of Pool C, this is Ludwigia. And it has expanded because of those stabilized water levels. And it is our anticipation that once C is removed and we have flow again and we have the right hydro period that this will be outcompeted. If not, we have land management at at bay, ready to go to try to help eliminate this from the system. Uh, within the river channel, here's without flow, here's with flow. You see it's just, it's amazing what just getting the right hydrology can do. Uh, sandbars, we talked about those earlier and you're like, okay, sandbars, what are they good for? Well, they're good for mussels. Mussels were almost removed from the system during the channelization. This is Liptio bucklei. And uh, now we've gone from density and biomass of almost nothing to it's on that trajectory to the reference condition. So that's a pretty good response. Uh, also invertebrate response. When a big tree falls in the water, it's no longer called a big tree. Now it's woody debris. <laughs> large woody debris. So large woody debris is uh, very important for specific stages of insects. Uh, Hetogeneid, mayflies, caddisflies, they cling on to this this wood, they have to, when they cling, you know you have good dissolved oxygen levels because they have these really cool gills along their back and they have to have water passing over those gills that has oxygen. So when you see these nice little indicator species that have come back, you're saying, that's really cool. We have flow, we have good oxygen levels. The, when the eggs are actually deposited, they can, they can grow. So that's pretty cool and this is good fish food. Um, so both in density and biomass again, where we're almost down to nothing under the channelized condition, we're hitting that trajectory back up to our target. Fish community, what I've been looking at, um, the, you look at the reference rivers of the Oklawaha, St. John's, and Withlacoochee, and centrarchids, sunfishes, and bass make up 70% of the relative abundance, but in the Kissimmee, it had dropped down below 38. Uh, the target value is about 60%, which we hit in 2004 and seven. 2008 and 9, we had some pretty remarkable fish kills that kind of have altered the structure of the river channel, uh, of the fish community. But we expect, I mean, this was a quick rebound from 2001 to 2004, and we expect that to occur again once we get the right hydrology. <coughs> Going into birds, we have an expectation for long-legged wading birds that uh, on the restored floodplain, their density will be 3.6 birds per square kilometer. Of course, none of us have seen 0.6% of a bird flying around out there, unless you've been hunting, and uh, then you might have shot 0.4 of it away. But uh, <laughs> statistically, that's the number that we get. And what we're seeing is, is pretty, pretty remarkable and pretty quick. 
here you have in this flock alone, you have five different species of wading birds. And uh, the great thing about wading birds and waterfowl is they're using habitat on the landscape scale, meaning they've been flying their flyway and they've been looking down for years and saying, nope, 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 yes. <laughs> you know, and they come in and they say, hey, conditions are great, let's land, let's forage, this is a wonderful opportunity. So this, this wading bird response came on very, very quickly. And uh, what we're seeing is here is the end of the of construction. A year after construction, we already went to over 40 birds per square kilometer. Um, you see there are drought conditions where birds just aren't going to want to be there. But we've met the expectation. We use a three-year rolling average. So for every three-year grouping, we have met the expectation except during this three-year grouping where we were in drought and in another drought. Where, what y'all want to know? What's going on with the waterfowl? Um, the metric for waterfowl response, one is a return to species richness of greater than 13 species using the floodplain. And the wintering waterfowl density is a 3.9 ducks per square kilometer. Well, what have we seen? Um, we've got, this shows 10, but we actually have 11 species of ducks that are now using the floodplain and ones that haven't been seen since channelization. You've got the fulvous whistling duck, uh, northern pintail, northern shoveler, American widgeon, and ringneck duck. Uh, percent abundance, who's the most dominant bird out there? By far, blue-winged teal. 70% of the observations that we see are, are made up of blue-winged teal. Model ducks bring up the next 27% with the laundry list of the remaining bringing up the three. Uh, when is peak abundance in the dry season? December is when we see a, a big spike uh, during the southerly migration, and then again in March is when we see the most dense uh, flocks of, of ducks and waterfowl out on the floodplain, again here dominated by blue-winged teal and by model duck. But there is a peak abundance in the wet season of the black whistling duck, black belly whistling duck, and um, it's their breeding season here, and in the fa past five years, we've seen a really big increase from being almost never seen to now flocks of 100, 200 birds flying. Isn't that pretty? <laughs> that was this March. We had a flock of about 2,000 blue-winged teal out on the floodplain. Um, the duck response has been pretty dramatic as well. Our 3.9 ducks per square kilometer here has been met in every year except for that drought year. And uh, it's just been, it's been pretty remarkable. Here's your uh, three-year rolling averages. You see we've, even in that three year with the one bad in 2007, we still met the expectation for waterfowl response. Well, what are the conclusions of, of what we're seeing is restoration is still incomplete. We're seeing some tremendous interim response. Uh, we're, either approaching or have met some of those targets, but we haven't hit them all. But we don't expect the bulk of environmental benefits to be reached until 2015 when we implement the new headwater schedule, which will provide the hydrology to the system that we expect to drive then the remaining portion of the ecological lift. And with that, I thank you, and we'll take any questions. <laughs>